We are now approaching, in fact, we are opening the last session of today's uh, very exciting symposium, Faces of Israel at Expo 67. It's my uh, very special privilege, really it's a privilege, to introduce to you two very dear new friends, very special friends, uh, Sarah Griezmann and Kaya Dekelbaum. So please uh, um, join me in a warm applause of welcome. Of course, to many of you, neither Sarah nor Kaya need an uh, introduction. Uh, many of you are friends, you're connected uh, through their important work in the community. But today, they have a very important story, in fact, several stories to tell us uh, about their very special experience and contribution to the successful participation of Israel in this landmark event, Expo 67. So what we decided to do uh, was to have uh, a very informal conversation, and my role really, uh, unlike during the rest of the day, is really just to moderate, if at all necessary. I do have a number of questions uh, that I brought with myself that I would like to get your reactions and answers to, uh, but really the point, the central point uh, of this last session is to have an opportunity to have a conversation between you, members of the community, of the public, uh, and our uh, distinguished guests, uh, Kaya and Sarah. Perhaps before we start, I want to ask them a very challenging and somewhat controversial question. If you ladies would care to just turn around for a moment, you see this very mm, troublesome picture. It's of course a picture from the Jerusalem Post, showing us a number of Arab hostesses. Uh, who were on their mission to come to Israel, uh, sorry, to, to Montreal to represent Israel in the pavilion. What I would like to ask you, as a start for this conversation, is to tell us what's correct about this picture, because so many things are actually false. So uh, what do we need to know about this picture that has become iconic in the history of Expo 67? Well, first of all, I think it's a um, photo montage. Because <laughs> we were never Al Al hostesses. We were hostesses at the Israeli pavilion. We were wearing Al Al uniforms because at the time Israel did not have the budget to offer us separate uniforms. So they said, okay, you'll be wearing Al Al uniforms. So we were all had the made to measure to us. And this is the photograph probably taken just before we were going on the plane at the airport, except this is not a plane even. <laughs> <laughs> and we were not a lot of hostesses. We are the right number there. We are 13 girls. Uh, although the, the final number of hostesses that were selected were 15, but two were sort of extra in case a couple of us drop out. So there are 13 of us, and we're standing exactly as we were taught to stand, with one leg in front of the other, with the white gloves in our hands. <laughs> All um, beautifully coiffed, with the right hat, with the right angle. The only thing that is right in this picture is the hostesses. <laughs> um, we actually <coughs> left this room not with an, maybe we left with an LL uh, plane to Paris, and from Paris we continued to Montreal on an LL, on a Air France plane, because there were no, as we heard, as we heard there was no connection between, uh, there were no Israeli flights landing in uh, Montreal at the time, and for us, all of us, all the 13 hostesses, it was the first experience to be on an airplane. Because until then, uh, even if we did leave to is uh, Israel, uh, we left by boat. And to get on the plane was uh, very, very, very exciting. We didn't know exactly what is the salt of the pepper, and uh, will we get food we need to know. But we learned pretty fast, and since then, we did travel a lot, right? Please tell us about how you became hostesses. How did you end up becoming one of the 13, 15, according to the article 16, so we really don't know the numbers, one of those mysteries of the event. Did you apply? Uh, were you approached? What's the story? Okay, 
so uh, my story, but I think it was very similar to Sarah's story. I was a student in Jerusalem at the university, and my father phones and says, Kaya, you know, they're looking for hostesses uh, in the Israeli pavilion, for an Israeli pavilion. They want the girls to be after military service, preferably officers in the army speaking French and English. It is the post for you. I said, Abba, they will never choose me. I'm not a daughter of a minister. I'm not a daughter of a judge. You know, protexia, it's a big word in Israel. They will never choose me. So my father applied for me. <laughs> and um, once he applied and they responded, and uh, I had to go to the exams. Uh, and we were 600, yeah. 600 girls uh, that had to pass uh, the exams psychometric exam, geography of Israel, French and English. We, we have to be more or less presentable and to appear to be able to speak in public, to, to, to address people and so on. And um, my story is quite similar because it was my father who said, why don't you apply? I said, come on, you can't be serious. First of all, they will never take me. And secondly, it's six months away from home. Are you going to let me be away? And um, so, yeah, we passed the test, and then once we got down to 15, um, there was a course that we had to take a six months preparatory course, which included geography and history and general world affairs and uh, things to do with Canada, how to speak in, with the public, how to deal with the public, and of course, coming from Israel in 1967, where um, manners, table manners, and, and so we're not really on top of priority. We had to have a course in uh, manners and how to dress properly, how to put ourselves together, and so So that's how we got to be here. Uh, I just want to add one thing. One of the funniest things was uh, that in the course of uh, learning how to behave, they told us, well, when you come to Israel, forget being an Israeli tough girl. So when you walk, towards the door, don't walk, try to walk fast, open the door and make sure you go through it. When you walk with your partner, if a friend that will come with you, you start slowing down before you reach the door and then make sure that he will open the door for you and <laughs> let you pass first. <laughs> so we did. <laughs> According to um, some of the social or rumors pages in some of the newspapers, there were many marriage proposals uh, being offered to some of the hostesses. Um, how did you connect with the local Jewish community and with the local community in general? Well, first of all, I think Lillian, why don't you stand up? Oh. <laughs> Lillian and her late lovely husband were very involved with the Jewish community and they I don't know, they, they were assigned to somehow connect the hostesses with the Jewish community. So one of the projects that they organized was to have two hostesses invited to a Friday night dinner at the Jewish home um, on Friday nights. Since we were working in shifts, that meant that every second Friday we did not work. And that's how um, got to know a lot of people in the community and also because I suppose young men in the Jewish community in the general community said, ah, there are 13 girls in the Israeli pavilion, well, let's see, let's check them out. <laughs> yeah, Kaya ended up marrying a boy from Montreal, I ended up marrying a boy from Montreal, that's how I'm here. <laughs> and, and there is uh, another one who married, but that didn't work out, and then there were two who were already married but not to Montreal boys, so. There's one other thing I should add. We chose to send them to Friday night dinner at Jewish homes with eligible <laughs> <laughs> So can I... I of course, of course. <laughs> so uh, when I met uh, Richard, uh, my husband, <laughs> today, uh, I wrote home, uh, I just met this young doctor, uh, then my parents told me that my father said to my mother, Annie, it's time to go to Montreal and check what's going on. And uh, at the time, they, 
economical uh, situation in Israel was horrible, and the trip from Tel Aviv to Montreal and back was very, very expensive. My mother had the habit of buying uh, lottery tickets, and uh, <laughs> one Friday she goes to with the lottery ticket, and she won exactly the amount of the ticket, airfare ticket from Tel Aviv to Montreal and back. And with that, she came to Montreal, and I got permission from the hostesses in our apartment that she could stay with us. And that's how she met uh, the Dagger Bombs. <laughs> and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> We've talked about the success of the Israeli pavilion from many, many points of view already today. And certainly the hostess has also contributed to a very important, successful achievement uh, of the pavilion. So I'm going to illustrate that by reading out an excerpt from uh, the October 1 edition of the Jerusalem Post in 1967. And here it goes. I'm going to ask then Sarah and Kaya to reflect on the, reflect on the story. An Israeli hostess came in second in the Hostess 67 contest at Expo Hostess. Sarah Shamir of the Israeli Pavilion was elected first deputy to Miss Expo 67. First prize, a trip to Mexico, went to mini-skirted British hostess Joanna Goodman. The election was promoted by the Mexican and Tunisian pavilions, and competition was held in stages in these two pavilions. Miss Shamir, 21 years old, born in Tel Aviv, is a student of English literature and French at Tel Aviv University, and was chosen with 13 other girls out of 16, 600 applicants to represent Israel at Expo. All nations represented in Expo took part in this competition. A Dutch girl came third. What happened at this competition? Um, it was very interesting. Every pavilion sent one girl obviously, and we had the morning before, the day before or something, a preliminary selection, and I looked around and I saw all these gorgeous looking girls from Scandinavia and everywhere else, and I said, come on, you're joking. What are you doing here? Anyways, at the competition, um, they asked us, first of all, to, to walk on the, we were all dressed in our regular uniforms, so we walked on the um, runway, and then they asked each girl a question, and we were supposed to elaborate on it uh, in English and in French. And I guess they liked what uh, I said. Um, a very interesting tidbit. This was a few months after the Six Day War. And of course, there was still a lot of uh, bad feelings in the Arab world about what happened. And. Um, just prior to the announcement of the, uh, of the winners and so on, I was chatting behind the scene with a, with a lot of people from the Tunisian pavilion. And they were extremely friendly, they knew exactly where I was from. On a one-to-one -one person, there was no problem, it was very nice. But the moment it was announced that I was a runner-up, they all disappeared, there was no official contact at all. And uh, I mean, the, some people said that probably or possibly I could have been number one, but the Tunisians would not have accepted because they would not have wanted to be seen as supporting an Israeli candidate. So, but anyway, it was nice. It was nice for the Israeli Pavilion because it just gave us another little something. Kaya, how was it all perceived by the other hostesses? What? How was it all perceived by the other hostesses? Were you all cheering for Sarah? Or was she the champion of the team? I wasn't there. No, no, no. You, you came nobody, nobody was in the hall. No, she I was, was alone. I was alone. I, I did not. I, I didn't go to the other hostesses. They not they come. Weren't. They were working. I only had one or two friends in the crowd. Interesting. Yeah. Of course I would cheer for. <laughs> but you didn't have the opportunity to do so. Um, I, I believe for all, but certainly for many among the hostesses, this would have been the first trip to Canada, the first encounter with the people of Canada, the people of Quebec, the people of Montreal. Do you remember your impressions of 
the Quebecois, the French Canadian, the English Canadian, and if so, what did you think of the Canadian man, the Canadian woman, the Canadian person? What were what were your first impressions of Canada, Montreal, and Quebec? It was my first time in Montreal, and uh, everybody was so friendly to us. Everybody was. Um, welcoming wherever we went. We had a little bit of difficulty with the French Quebecois, uh, with the language, uh, because we all spoke French and here we come and there is a new accent that we couldn't understand. But um, the, everybody was really welcoming, uh, almost saying, oh, you came here for Expo, it's going to be wonderful, we'll come to the pavilion to visit you. And of course, then the Jewish community that embraced us and uh, made us feel right away very, very comfortable. Uh, yes, the Jewish community, and then of course, on top of that, after the Six Day War, after Israel won the war, I mean, there was an explosion of sympathy, people from all walks of life, from all countries, um, Canadians too. You didn't have any sense of animosity that you might have today, for instance, because people have a different agenda. But it was very open. Plus, Israel was an, an, an unknown quantity at the time. Israel was hardly 20 years, when I think about it, 20 years country is really nothing. So we were sort of from another planet. So, is it fair to say that, as far as you remember, the average Canadian visitor didn't know much about Israel? Did they know? What was your impression about the general knowledge of Jewish history? Did they, did they know about the Holocaust, the Shoah? Did they ask you questions about the history of Israel? Were there particular questions that you got asked more often than not? Yes, the, the tr it's true that the average Canadian, especially the non-Jewish ones, did not have much knowledge about Israel, about, nor about uh, the history. I think they knew more about perhaps the Old Testament or even the Bible, the, the Christian Bible. Um, about the Holocaust, very often people would look at the display and say, are you sure this was six million people? Are you sure? It, it's, not, it's not possible. It's not possible, um, and many people were shocked by it. But I think they, the, the average person did not have much knowledge about any other country other than Canada, so Israel was not unique in that. <laughs> Favorite moment? Favorite moments? No moments. Oh, there were so many. <laughs> I think that... Um, the first thing to say that we were very, very fortunate to be in Montreal in Expo 67 during this time because this was the center of the world and us, not only the Israeli pavilion hostesses, but all the hostesses, I'm sure, we were the center of the pavilions and the center of Expo 67. I would also say that the pavilion without the hostesses would not be the same because we were the life of the pavilion and uh, each one of us, we were, wherever we were positioned, uh, added uh, not only by explaining what, uh, what was our station, but also just by being there and talking about Israel in general and ha having, cre having a conversation with uh, the visitors. And uh, the other thing was really, this, this was the center of the world. Now, there are a few anecdotes that I can tell you of little things that happened during the expo. Do you want to talk about? Well, I would say one of the happiest moments, <laughs> excuse me, was uh, when the Six Day War ended and Israel came out victorious and there was such an explosion of uh, support and, and sympathy from everyone, from people on the street, from, from visitors, from other hosts and hostesses. We were invited, 
I think it was the night after, to a party at the Ontario Museum, because various, uh, not museum, sorry, public pavilion, uh, various pavilions had held parties for the staff after the pavilions used to close. So when we arrived, the Ontario party became a, a party for Israel. And everybody was just congratulating us and singing, and, and we, we felt like kings of the castle. Um, and just like I said, just to be at Expo, to be able to see all these mar marvels, and there was really no other word for it. It was marvels, uh, the Czech Pavilion, the various restaurants. The, it was just amazing. I would like to say one thing about uh, the connection between the pavilion and the Jewish community. It was talked about uh, during the symposium here. So when we came to, when I came to the pavilion, I can talk about myself. But when I came to the pavilion, I came. I'm an Israeli. Here I am in the pavilion representing Israel. And really, there was no connection between in my mind, and in many Israelis' mind at the time, between Israel and the Jewish, and the Jews of the diaspora. Yeah, they give money and they like Israel and everything, but this is one entity and we are another. When I was in the pavilion, and uh, the Jewish people of Montreal and of Canada and the United States and other countries started coming to the pavilion, and especially as it was getting closer towards uh, the Six Days War, there was a, a connection that was created almost mystically between uh, me, the Israeli, and I'm sure it happened to other hostesses too, and the Jews that came to the pavilion. And all of a sudden, I felt that I cannot anymore say, I am Jew and from Israel, and that's it, and you, you are whatever you are. But there was this identification with uh, the Jews of the diaspora, and I felt almost that I am embraced by them and I'm happy to be embraced for them. And this was a very big change in the way in the way that I was thinking and in the way I think today. So thank you. Of course a monumental event uh, that took place during Expo 67 was the Six Day War. Um, what were your initial reactions to the news that the mobilization eventually became warfare? How did you, do you remember how you reacted to it? What were your initial thoughts? You had a job to do far, far away from home. Your family, your friends were there. How did you deal with this? As you said, you said exactly half the answer already. We were all very worried, and it was not just during the Sex Day War, it was the weeks leading to it, because the tension was building up. You could get reports all the time. There was mobilization, so we knew that this was going to happen. And then when things really started uh, happening, we all wanted to go home. Of course, we wanted to be with our families. And uh, Kaya will agree with me. Um, we got a, a, a talk from our director, a pep talk, saying that your place is right here. Your job is to represent Israel. Uh, you, you are soldiers in a way, so put on a smiley face and uh, just go on. And we all were so, so worried as you can imagine because we didn't know Israel was in a great disadvantage numerically, power-wise and everything. So it was an existential uh, danger to Israel. And things worked out, thank goodness, and uh, we were relieved afterwards. Kai, do you have anything? We were actually mobilized in the pavilion, and uh, I think our role was very important because people came from all over, and we were the suppliers of information. People asked, so what's happening? Is everything okay? And you had a feeling that uh, people gathered in the pavilion like a safe house, you know, 
uh, here we can hear more, we can we know, we will know more what is happening and uh, it was very important that we were there. You asked us if the pavilion was ever closed, it didn't close, not even for one day, uh, throughout the war, uh, we were just there all the time. Did you ever have the sense that through your role at Expo 67, you became celebrities at home? No, I don't think so. Israelis are very blessed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, we came back, we went back to our studies, Kaya went back to University of Jerusalem, I went back to Tel Aviv University to normal life. Yeah, there may have been one or two articles or something. And, uh, we had a reunion. We had, uh, we actually had two reunions. You have to tell about the one that you organized. The what? The one you organized. I organized two. two. <laughs> <laughs> I organized two reunions. Uh, one, I think, was about five years after Expo, and it was at my parents' house in uh, Savion. And then uh, in 1995, uh, I organized another reunion and uh, it was in our house in Jerusalem. And this was actually very nice because the hostesses came, uh, plus Coneta uh, Vital and uh, other people that were part of the pavilion. And each one, because we haven't seen each other for such a long time, and each one had to tell what did she do throughout uh, these years, family, work, hobbies and uh, it was a very interesting event. The interesting part of it was that when we met, everybody was embracing and kissing. Hi, oh, how are you with that? But when we parted, it was almost like a handshake. Like, okay, we met, those are the friends, we remained friends. It was nice seeing you all, but we don't know if we'll see you again. And the next time we met was at the uh, in the Tel Aviv uh, Museum uh, just a few weeks ago. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's now time to give you an opportunity to ask whatever you always wanted to know about behind the scenes in the Israeli Pavilion at Expo 67, because this is your chance to get the right answer from the ladies who actually made it all happen. So just please raise your hand and uh, we would love to hear your answer. It's very good answer to do a very good interview. Um, I'd like to know about the working conditions. Uh, it's 50 years later. Would you be too shy in telling us how much you got paid? And did you use your salary to pay for rent at a home? Were you all together in different apartments? How many of you were together? How was it? How was the housing? Uh, the, how was that arranged? And food and so on and so forth. So let me just repeat the question for the benefit of our uh, friends who may not have heard it. So the question is about uh, very mundane working conditions. Uh, what was the pay scale and what did you use the money for? Uh, because I still have some issues with Israeli income tax. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to keep the secret if you don't mind. And I've been suing the Israeli Kupat Cholim. Do you know what that is? That's yes. the health care. Because they did not deduct enough from my service here. So this is 50 years later. So I think I'm going to keep all that information <laughs> a secret if you don't mind. Well, not you personally, but in general, what was the official? Oh, we did not become very wealthy. Did you use salary to pay for you for your stay, or did you? Were you uh, we extra? actually got donations. Oh, we, we lived in an apartment that was paid for. Whatever we paid, we were just happy to be here. So the amount doesn't really matter. And uh, it was our privilege to be here, and we enjoyed it very much. We had very nice uh, living quarters in uh, Montreal, Center Urban, and, and corner of uh, Prince Arthur. And we were three girls in an apartment, and uh, it was really wonderful. Very nice. Yeah. I can show it at the end, but I have to tell you. Uh, but Ted, say also that we were not the only ones, because the whole building was full of hosts. Ah, the whole home. building was full of uh, people that worked in uh, education. Yeah. Yeah. And what about the Commissioner General? Excuse me? Jacob Denai was his name? Yeah. It, it, he lived in a villa in West Mount. <laughs> 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 yeah. so what did he do when he got back to so the... So the question, uh, the question was, uh, what about Jacob Denai? Of course, the, uh, uh, in charge of the Israeli team. 
Uh, and the answer was that he lived in a villa in Westmount. Yes, disgusting. Okay, next question. Uh, yes, Lydia. So the question is about what actually took place at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, to which Kaya briefly alluded to. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yes, I was at the Tel Aviv Museum uh, during the opening night of the, of the exhibition there. Uh, <clears throat> the exhibition was mainly about the architect, uh, the building, the exterior part of the building, and the display. Uh, not much was said about the hostesses, but uh, um, we got permission to talk eventually. <laughs> and uh, it was a very interesting exhibit because uh, uh, the area is uh, beautiful and they had beautiful pictures of uh, the plans, uh, the way the pavilion was made, um, the different pictures that uh, we saw now. and. Uh, it was really very interesting display, which still goes on. Please, yeah. Sam. You told us that you were given an instruction about how to talk and how to behave and so forth. Now, rightly or wrongly, North American perception that the Israelis tend to believe that most Israelis are very frank, outspoken kind of people. So did this present any kind of personal conflict in terms of how you normally behave and how you respect to behave in your job? So the question is um, how the special training that the hostess has received about, um, uh, about proper social behavior and etiquette help them prevent future, I imagine that's what you want to uh, you know, uh, some future conflicts and how they benefited no, from I'm the... No, I'm also wondering how if they, did, if they did not personally have problems with this kind of that expectation were different than their normal behavior. All right, so I, I apologize. Whether, yeah. whether there was any sort of change that that's remained out so, so the question is um, um, how the hostess is, how you uh, reacted to this expectation of behaving differently other than what you, uh, what you were normally used to and accustomed to. We didn't really behave that differently. I mean, <laughs> when you're among friends, you allow yourself sometimes to speak more directly. But when you're with people that you don't know that well, even everywhere, not just in Israel, you, you have a different uh, style of speech. So. That's, that's how we were. We were very polite. We tried to be polite, what we thought. We tried to be instructive. And um, so it wasn't really, that was never really an issue, nor a hardship, or, or any really a big adjustment. It's just, you each just a little we bit more polite. polite. Yeah. Roberta. surprised us, both from the Jewish and the non-Jewish community, with their knowledge. And many, many people did not know too much, not only about Israel, but about many other countries. I mean, a lot of Americans would, would 
tell us, you know, we never knew what Canada was like. We thought everybody was living in igloos. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, nothing unusual. I think that if you live in a very large country and you're not uh, affected by world events, there's not really a need to know that much about other countries. So, kind of. Yes. You got, uh, Professor Lerner. Yes, there's a, an exhibition at the McCord Museum on the um, uh, uniform to the hostesses. I yes. wonder if you could share with us your reaction to as young women wearing this particular type of uniform. So the question is about how the hostesses reacted to, to the uniform, the allied uniforms that they were expected to wear. And on that note, Professor Lerner also reminds us that there is a special exhibition at the McCord Museum dedicated to the uh, hostess uniforms at Expo 67. So we actually had uh, two uniforms. Uh, one was uh, the El Al uh, suits that we had to wear. And uh, we felt very comfortable wearing them. And then we had a formal dress, uh, which was made by an Israeli designer, Fini Leitersdorf. And it was a short dress with Yemenite embroidery, um, and sort of a silver gold shimmering, and it was uh, very pretty. And uh, we liked it. We, at the end, we had to return everything to the Israeli government. <laughs> 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 I have to say, I was jealous of a few uh, pavilions because they had the most breathtaking uniforms. The Italian one, the, even the Canadian one had Korean. one of the Korean, well, Korean <laughs> and national dress, but very modern, beautiful suits by other, but, but in Israel that was not a priority at the time. Uh, Jamal? Thank you again for the presentation. Um, Yes. Uh, I have, my mom lives in Damascus, Syria. Right. And my brother right now lives in Manchester. So okay. Yesterday, we were very sick with all the communication technology that is available to us, FaceTime and what have you. I couldn't reach my brother on time, and I, I didn't sleep last night until he rang me in the morning. I was wondering, what did you do personally on the day when you heard the war break broke out, and, and could you call? Were there any kind of, you know, just instead of like listening to secondhand news, were you able to like contact your parents or like your family? So the question is a very personal, anecdotal question about um, what the hostesses, what Kaya and Sarah did um, immediately upon first hearing that uh, the war, the Six Day War broke out. Were they able to call? Uh, what was their way of uh, primary communication rather than just relying on secondary source? First of all, at the time, telephone calls to Israel were very expensive. And so I didn't speak to my parents on the phone for most of the summer, with the exception of the night after the, uh, the, Expo, the Miss Expo competition. I just wanted to call them and tell, let them know that I won. But otherwise, we had news coming from, well, the people at the, at the pavilion informed us what was happening. We wrote letters, and the letters took whatever it took to get there. And I guess when you don't expect to have immediate communication, you live with it. There's no, no choice. But the majority of us did not really call. We did not have immediate. It's not, it's not fun. We have to remember it was 50 years ago, so uh, it's not like today you, you have FaceTime and you have uh, uh, WhatsApp and uh, it's, uh, you can speak to anybody you want. So we really didn't talk to anybody. But we, um, Yaakov Yanai, who was the director of the pavilion, at the end of the war uh, wrote a very, very beautiful letter explaining what happened during the war and how did Israel win and I guess it came a bit faster because it came in a diplomatic career uh, directly to the Israeli consulate here and straight into the pavilion. So this was the only way we heard about what is happening. Uh, 
the other way I heard about or saw something about uh, what happened in Israel is uh, I opened the Paris match uh, during the war and I'm going through the pages and in the center fold I look and I see a picture of one of my best friends in Israel, Shimon, sitting inside a burn tank with his feet up in the air and smoking a cigarette. And I just couldn't believe it. So this was the way I knew that Shimon is well and alive. And of course, I sent him right away the paper. It took about three weeks to get there, <laughs> but he still has it. So this was a way of getting the information. I'm very sorry for you, but that's that to, I mean, I understand how, where you come from, but it was a different time. That's more, yes, sir. A comment, it's not really a question. What you experienced by coming here was a party for 15 people, as well as all the other pavilions had their own group. Montreal also was going through a party at the same time, because they put Canada on the map, and they put Montreal on the map, right. and everybody was in a good mood. Probably the last 10 years, the Quebec government has tried desperately to make say so that this party, a party to be exclusive for everyone. It has not really worked. And as much as it was a coming out party for Montreal and Canada at the time, the highlight was what you experienced at the beginning. The downfall was when uh, Charles de Gaulle came to Montreal and changed the climate for the rest of the world, that we could never really have that again in Montreal. Maybe in Toronto, but Montreal will never be successful having that kind of party here. Even on our drive down here today, on Cote de Neige, there's many square red signs that mean nothing to anybody. We don't know how many millions of dollars were spent on that, but the public is not happy with the government the way it was 50 years ago. Okay, we put up the Jacques Cartier Bridge with lights. Yeah. It's just a commentary on the time. It was a party for everybody. That's right. Steve. There was no no right. hate in the streets, nothing. Thank you. Yeah. You both married Canadians. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you met him and how you felt about second Karen? <laughs> okay, so the question is about your spouses, how you met them, and a little bit, I guess, the gentleman would like to hear a bit more about that, uh, the, the story that we briefly talked about earlier. Personally, I feel that this is more like a uh, sort of a gossip column <laughs> question. <laughs> I'm sorry. But we met them through, we were invited to some Jewish homes and we met them there. That was in my case. I met uh, Richard's brother at the time was in Israel and uh, he, he gave one of the hostess a telephone number of the Deckelbaums in Ultramar and she, she called and then she came back and she said, oh, they have two wonderful brothers and one of them is definitely for you, which uh, <laughs> I guess it happened <laughs> and uh, we got married two years later. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Logan Bilecki? Yeah, I have a question about background. I, I can't, can't hear. I have a question about background. Um, you said that you fit in and the criterion was ex officers in the IPF. Not um, necessarily, I was. What not. kind of backgrounds, what kind of backgrounds do all the hostels have? Okay, so the question is about the, um, the background that the hostess applicants and actually the successful ones were expected to have. Uh, did you have to be a uh, particular reference to uh, being an IDF officer? Yes, no. Linguistic repertoire, uh, how many languages? And in general, what backgrounds did you have to have? Where your families came from also. I'm sorry? Where your families came from was also significant. Um, we did not have to be in IDF offices. Kaya was. I was a lowly non commissioned whatever you call it. <laughs> sergeant. I was a sergeant. No, we all had to be after military service, at least, and we had to speak English and French, obviously. And I guess they would have preferred somebody who was already studying or had studied or something like that. They wanted people who had general knowledge, who came from... Uh, once you go to university, that means that you have graduated high school at a certain level, so you have a certain amount of knowledge. So that was the criteria. And probably ladies who would be presentable and personable. So that, these were the criteria, I think. And then there was a committee. So uh, once uh, out of the 
600 girls. They chose, I think, 35 who were interviewed, and uh, the committee chose 15, and then 13 left. So we were very happy to be here. Yeah. Yes, uh, Lilia? So uh, Lilia put, uh, puts it out that one of the hostesses spoke 13 languages fluently. 13 languages. Uh, Janice. So the question is whether uh, Sarah and Kaya would know how many of the other hostesses still live in Israel today. Live in Israel. Five all together, yeah. so there are yeah we are f uh, four that lived in Israel and I was there uh, visiting. visiting. Well, they have to be um, four. Dagmar lives outside. No, Dagmar lives in Chicago. Outside. outside. Yeah, and the uh, rest are living uh, all over. Uh, they're in the United States and Canada. Uh, so, yeah, no, I know, but we don't count. So. Four no. are living in Israel. For sure, only four? Yeah, Neta, Olit, Gabi, and me. And Kaya. And uh, Raya. And Raya, yeah, five. About five or six. Five live in Israel, yeah. Five or six, yeah. So five or six. Okay, uh, Professor Durkheim. I just wanted to... Um, there were some unusual people that took an interest in you. Can you tell us about, sorry, about the Japanese reporter? Okay, so the question is about some unusual people who took special interest in you. And Professor Lerner asks Sarah to tell us a little bit more about the mysterious Japanese reporter. <laughs> <laughs> so for the uh, opening ceremonies, um, each pavilion was supposed to set two hostesses. And I was sent together with Dagmar, the one who speaks 13 languages. And uh, there were photographers from every country in the world. And they took all sorts of photographs. We, and we just didn't pay attention because there were so many of them and it was so exciting. Actually, I think you'll see a photograph that I'm talking about uh, in the exhibition. Um, a month or two later, I get in the mail a magazine, a Japanese, I guess it was a monthly, with the front cover was the full color picture of Dagmar and I uh, under the Israeli flag. So I guess they found that that was suitable, whatever. And um, then the Japanese um, journalist who took the photo, whatever, came and said, um, we would like to do a feature about you. Uh, a day in the life of the Israeli uh, hostesses. And uh, he followed two or three of us throughout the day into the pavilion while we were working our shift. The shifts were two, uh, six hours. And then he went with us shopping in the supermarket and on the street and wherever we went. And then he came to our apartment. And all of that was, of course, an article that he was writing for his magazine with photographs and so on. And uh, eventually it did appear in their magazine. I, 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 of course, I, can't, I don't read Japanese. I just saw the pictures. And um, we remained in contact for a few years. We actually corresponded. I think he even came to Israel for a visit. And I think he was going, he went to a kibbutz. And it was, but it was a very sort of unexpected tidbit, very un unexpected anecdote. Kaya, any story from your recollection? No one told me. <laughs> so clearly, Expo 67 and the, uh, the experience of the Israeli pavilion changed this is the life of this uh, Japanese uh, reporter. Yes. How did those few months in Montreal, how did this experience change you? <laughs> <laughs> How did this change us? Yeah. Yes. Well, 
really changed uh, my life because uh, I ended up marrying Richard. I uh, created a family together with him. That is uh, one member of the family is here, Dan, uh, our son, and he lives in Montreal. And uh, it really was something um, that I didn't expect, and my parents definitely <laughs> didn't think that I'm going to end uh, in Montreal or United States or anywhere else but Israel. And uh, yes, it did happen, but um, it was a wonderful thing that happened to me because uh, Richard is a wonderful person, and I have a very interesting uh, life uh, with him and with our family. And uh, so for me, it was besides those six months that were amazing, I think the last 50 years were just as amazing. I think for a young Israeli woman in those years, uh, and we did not have too many opportunities to go abroad for a long period of time, I think for any of us, it would have been a, uh, a really sea change occurrence. Um, I was studying at the time at, at Tel Aviv University. I almost got a taste really to, to aspire to study abroad because it was it just opened your mind and so on. Besides being from Israel or living in Israel, um, the idea of going abroad would have been somewhat challenging and frightening because we did not know what it was all about. But once you've been exposed to it, it's uh, easy. It's easier to imagine what life would be here like. I had no intention originally of coming here or staying here. But then, just like Kaya, I got married, we had a very interesting life, we had children, uh, so that changed me, of course. I got involved in the Jewish community, which is not something which is self-evident, uh, because most Israelis, at least of that of our generation, did not view the organized Jewish community as a viable occupation. We, we always felt, felt that uh, the Jewish community was mainly active in, in fundraising and had sort of a feeling of uh, entitlement when they would come to Israel. And we Israelis resented it. So I was on that side, of, on the Israeli side, but having come here and lived here for a few years and gotten involved myself in the Jewish community, I learned to admire and to respect a lot of what was being done in the Jewish community. So that is a very big change. I think maybe today in Israel there's more of an understanding of that uh, mutual relationship between the two communities, between Israel and the diaspora. But at the time, it was not self-evident. Thank you for those very beautiful and uh, meaningful words. Uh, thank you. We have time for maybe two more questions. So ladies and gentlemen, please let me know if you have a question to ask. If not, yes, Stanley will give you then the penultimate question. It's a little bit of a question from left field. The times, of course, were different. It was 50 years ago. Uh, it probably was advertised in the Israeli newspapers, 600 or, or women requested, right? No men were requested. No men didn't have a right to become a host. No, was there any discussion about that in Israel at the time that maybe some men, young men of your age would have liked to come also, but they only were hiring women and it was considered normal at the time? How did you feel about it? Did you have to hear about any repercussions from young men it's a, students, for example? It's a very interesting question about the nature of the times. So uh, the question, Stanley's question is about why hostesses were recruited and looked for? Why men, gentlemen, young men, could not, were not eligible to apply for the position of a host. Was it accepted? Was there a discussion about it uh, uh, at the time in Israel? Why uh, the nature of the, of the recruitment was so uh, uh, gender biased, if you will? I have a very good answer. Um, among the 600 applicants, there were men as well. Uh, why they were not chosen, I don't know, but they were definitely 
<laughs> they were men as well among the applicants, yeah. How many? I don't know. When you come to an exam with 600 other people, you're so nervous, you don't count the men around. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't think that it would have been. Uh, I don't think it was deliberate. There's one thing. Don't forget that in Israel, the men served three years in the army. They would have been already at 21. They would not have had the experience of going to study, and they probably would, their first priority would not have been to go uh, on a six months um, expedition abroad if they were willing to go and study, if they intended to go and study afterwards. So I don't think it And we have, uh, oh, okay, we'll take um, the last three questions. So we'll take from uh, over here one, Professor Zena, and from the gentleman over here. Yes. No, I was, I was going to say that, that they were on airlines they had also only women, but then I remembered, not at all, because I, I had some friends who were men on the airlines, so I think they were, they were the minority at the time. Okay, um, Professor Sam? Just that that's the gender bias of the period, I yeah. mean, you know. Women were hostesses and men drove the planes. But no, but the, yeah, occasionally there was no, somebody. In other pavilions, they were they had lots of men. Sorry. Yeah, in other pavilions they had lots of men hosts. Well, they did. Yeah, it wasn't just women. Yeah, no. Well, it looked it's like the beauty queen. Uh, Here. Yeah. Yeah. No. No, it was it was women, but it, I think really several things. First of all, like Kaya said, there were some. Candidates, maybe their French wasn't good enough, I don't know, or whatever, and then they served three years in the army. I don't think too many men wanted really. And um, I don't think it was deliberate. You don't think it's what? Deliberate. I don't think it was deliberate because in other pavilions there were many, many men hosts, and we were friendly with the hosts and hostesses. Well, maybe it was deliberate in the Israeli. Okay. Maybe. I don't, I don't know. Okay. And the last question from the gentleman. Yeah, you uh, uh, referred to the economic situation in Israel at the time. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that, especially the difference between Tel Aviv, more kind of like a modern city, compared to Jerusalem, which has an ancient history. And like, what were the differing economic conditions there at the time? So a very important question about uh, the nature of the economic reality. Uh, in Israel at the time, with specific reference to uh, the economic disparities between places such as Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and how this all related to the experience of the hostesses. Frankly, it was a period of recession throughout the country. It had, there was no difference between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. It was just a recession. Uh, also, I don't know, that was before, I think, the um, oil crisis, so I can't even accuse the oil crisis for, for the reality, but it was just not a good time uh, financially, economically, and uh, the whole, throughout the whole country. Uh, well, we are running out of time, but before we would wrap up uh, this very exciting and very personal um, last session of the day, I would like to give both of you an opportunity to offer some final reflections on uh, your nostalgia, your memory, um, on Expo 67, whatever else you would like to share with us. Okay. So there is a lot of nostalgia. We were sitting, uh, Sarah and me, last night in Sarah's kitchen and uh, remembering uh, all the things that happened, all kinds of anecdotes that uh, happened to her, to me and uh, giggling a lot and laughing and uh, remembering really with uh, warm heart uh, of our experience. Um, maybe I can just share one of the things that we talked about, I remember uh, yesterday. Uh, as you know, we had the Dead Sea Scrolls and I was standing next to the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were very well kept and guarded. 
I see a little boy about 11 or 12 years old running around and running around and going under the case where they were and going around and in the back and I was getting nervous. What's going on? So I stopped him and I said, excuse me, can I help you? What are you looking for? And he looks at me and he says, I'm looking for the sign made in Japan. <laughs> Anecdotes, although I'm sure there were many, just that we all felt extremely, extremely privileged to have lived at that particular moment, to have been chosen to be here. Um, I feel very lucky to live in Canada, and that would not have happened had I not come to Expo. Um, I, I feel I have a foot in both countries, obviously. Um, it's a wonderful country, and uh, Montreal is very lucky to have had it. Let's hope that Montreal will, go, will get back to that kind of glory days. Well, Sarah and Kai, I would like to thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart uh, for this very, very meaningful and deep conversation that brought Israel, the Israel, the Israeli pavilion back to us uh, in a very personal and personally meaningful way to this academic conference. And that's the way um, you brought Israel back uh, here to us in Montreal, we would like to bring a little bit of Israel to you by giving you this small token of our appreciation. Here, here you are. And once again, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and for making this day. Even greater success.